back. We're live. This is Think Tech Energy 808, the cutting edge. I'm Jay Fidel, and we have Jay Griffin, who is the chair of the PUC, and Marco Mangelsdorf with us. Uh, they both join us by Zoom, and we're excited to have this discussion uh, to check up on the PUC and on energy in general in the state of Hawaii. Very important discussion. Marco, can you please introduce Jay Griffin? I'd be more than happy to, Jay, uh, Jay Fidel. Uh, Jay Griffin is someone I know, I've known for uh, quite a number of years now. Well, not that long, but we're kind of different. Uh, we're brothers from a different mother, in a sense. Uh, and uh, I, I think very, very highly of Jay. He's, he's not only one of the smartest guys I know, uh, but he's also got a great heart. And he, uh, there's nobody I would want to see other than Jay Griffin Dr. Jay Griffin is head of the PUC during these challenging times. And uh, it's always a great treat for me to be on with my JJ brothers uh, uh, together again. And I mean, we could go on for hours and hours and hours, but we have a shorter period of time together than hours and hours. So we'll, we'll do the best we can. So again, thank you so much, uh, Jay Griffin, for being with us today. And great to be back with you as well, my, my brother from another different mother, Jay Fidel. So. Well, with that intro, uh, I just wanted to ask you, Jay, to kind of get things started. Where, where do you find yourself? Or how, how is this COVID stuff? I mean, it's changed our lives dramatically, both in the micro and the macro. And how has it affected you personally as your stewardship of the, of the commission has necessarily had to, to, to adapt to a very, very different conditions. How, how are you doing personally through all this? Well, first off, it's great to see both of you. Um, Aloha. Good to see you're uh, here and healthy. After that intro, I may just drop off. It's hard to follow with anything. Um, so appreciate it, Marco. Um, okay, how are we doing? So the, the, the word I, and those of my staff that watch this will know, they've heard this word consistently through all this is perseverance. Um, so our, our organization has been able to adapt, um, through the, the need, um, we, we pretty quickly went to all electronic filings and that was driven by the, the desire to close our door to the public as quickly as we could, not because we didn't want the public in there, but we, we wanted to protect everyone's health as quickly as we could. And the, you know, there's a definite risk of, um, Every day we have people coming in and dropping off their filings. We have uh, people submitting applications. So we saw quickly that sooner we could do as much of that online, the sooner we could um, have everyone safer in our organization. So within about a week, we're able to update our processes, move to a basic on, or uh, move most of our processes online uh, and send almost all of our staff home. And they've been working remotely uh, almost entirely since mid-March. Uh, so that, you know, that was an incredible transition. Our, our staff put in, I mean, did things that we didn't think were possible or were going to take years, uh, but under the circumstances were necessary. And so it was, it was really rewarding to watch everyone contribute and do uh, and uh, work towards that. It's been a challenge as everyone is going through, you know, working from home is obviously has its ups and downs in managing a large team in that environment. Um, some things are easier, some other things become more challenging. It's, it's nice just to be able to walk into a room and talk sometimes. Uh, but again, there are, we, the perseverance has been the, the buzzword. I keep saying it every time we feel challenged by the events uh, before us and that we have been through hard times before and, and we, we continue to survive and drive as best as we can. You asked about me and that's been kind of my own, I tell myself the same thing. Um, you know, we have a young family and fortunate to spend the time together at home. Um, but you know, it's challenging times for everyone. You know, I've, I've been working at home, Jay, and I find I'm working harder. I put in more hours at home than I did in the studio before. Uh, and I think it's because uh, um, I'm comfortable with working at home and that I'd rather do that than anything else. <laughs> How about you? Uh, I guess I'll say it this way. Um, 
we put in long hours no matter what um in in any of these environments just the, given the workload i would say that the intensity is changed we have i mean given just the need to do things extremely quickly sometimes and kind of the the risk that you're facing and so you know that was with our transition with the office but we definitely have some I mean, the, the matters triggered by these events you know that have risen to a crisis level and you know that we're asked to help resolve so i think the workload has always been hard but the intensity and the the consequences the risks are definitely amplified for us mm. so you know we've, we've been through a number of phases the first phase was uh the, de the de denial in washington and and that um and that slowed down any any response um and then and then we realized uh, we the whole country realized we had to do something so we did something and we ultimately locked down as uh, and you responded to that in you know in march and and then and then now we reopened after that this i mean this is like a it keeps going back and forth and i, I think it will continue that way um then we reopened and everybody was a little hesitant about actually reopening uh and finally not not as a surprise it's a fairly predictable um, that the reopening would generate other cases and we'd have to retrench on the reopening. Some places they call it a pause. In any event, uh, uh, you know, where are you on that continuum? You're still locked down, essentially. You haven't reopened, I take it, and no need for you to do that, I guess. Um, and you haven't gone through the reopening and the pause of the reopening, right? You're still the same way you were back in March. Uh, close. What I've been saying, we're we're reopening slowly and carefully. We we transition quickly, um, and part of that was based on my wife's brother. Their family lives in Singapore, um, and so early on, they had a second wave and a third wave. Actually, of they they locked down, watched their cases drop off, and then they had a wave. I mean, kind of two successive waves after that. So could see that. You know that was going to be a definite risk and certainly in a state where we're so travel dependent you know we were just as prone to it so i kind of entered into this knowing that that kind of risk was always going to be there and so as people look to reopen and other state agencies been re reopening um we made a deliberate choice to go slowly because uh, we were working productively at home people are safe um and so we we've i mean on the range we have um we're kind of slowly reintegrating certain basic functions um but we haven't kind of set sent large groups of people back into the office and that was primarily based on sitting in a lot of discussions with other state agencies and as you start to work through the complexities of i mean all, everything that's necessary to well one our space won't really handle anywhere near the number of people that we had before. Uh, but just having enough uh, san um, sanitary supplies available, working through the protocols and certainly reopening to the public, you know, raises things to another threshold. So we've been going slowly on purpose. And the main intent is that, you know, we're trying to stay as productive as we can during this and stay safe. And my biggest concern continuing has been if we had a, a series of infections, a cluster in our office, I mean, how devastating would that be? And, you know, that's just, those are, you don't want to make those phone calls to people's family members saying this happened and, you know, we didn't know what we, we could have done about it. And so, yeah, I think we're just, we're trying to be deliberately safe, but I think we haven't had much of a trade-off in how it's affected our operations. You know, a lot of people we've talked to, Jay, they, they've learned things. They've learned maybe things they didn't have to do or that they could do these things a different way. Uh, they've learned how to be, um, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. They've learned, they've invented new things, new systems, new ways of doing business and communicating that they find are really attractive. And they've kind of decided uh, on a tentative basis to keep on doing that, no matter what happens going forward, um, kind of a you know an improvement 
based on the ad adversity of the, of the circumstances. It, what kinds of things have you found fit in that category for the PUC? I think the one that we moved to quickly uh, by necessity was uh, I mean the the greater reliance, I mean almost the entire reliance now on electronic filing. Um, and we're able to do that by relaxing, well, basically suspending our rules during the emergency on requirements for hard copy filings. And so, you know, for those that do a lot of business before our commission, there's a stream of people that come in and drop off hard copies of filings that we have a, a means of processing those. Um, but they're all, at the same time, they generally be sending us electronic versions. And so that was a lot of traffic, you know, in and out of the office and time and effort. And, you know, these are sometimes several thousand page filings and they need to make multiple copies. So sometimes we'd have vans show up with, you know, piles of paper and people coming into the office. <laughs> Uh, to which all of that is then scanned and put up online digitally. Uh, so I think, you know, that's a, we'll, we'll figure out which part of that is still necessary because uh, we have certain, um, you know, certain requirements, certainly, particularly a lot of the motor carriers come before us still prefer to send in hard copies. And so we'll look at the best way to, you know, provide the range of services. But I think that's the, that was a step that, uh, people thought was going to be very hard to transition past. And, you know, we did it in that week. And certainly those that work before us a lot, you know, that's a big time and cost that, that saved them. Um, so I think that's, that's been one lesson. We've had others, but that I think that's, that's what's allowed us to move into this environment and still be uh, fair. I mean, maintain our productivity. Okay, since the beginning of the year, or since the lockdowns of March, April, May, June, June, four months you know, for lockdown period, um, what, what kind of, to the extent you can talk about it, what kind of substantive decisions, um, changes in, you know, in, in, in dockets and the rules um, have come out of the PUC? Uh, how, how have you um, engaged with the energy community in that period? Yeah, thanks, Jay. Into the dive into the substance. I think probably one of the we moved, tried to move pretty quickly to you know, sustain a lot of the work that was going on. Um, you know, there was a. I don't. I don't think anyone can say that um, they could avoid disruption entirely. So we definitely had a few week phase where we were focused on making transition and getting people settled. But uh, fairly early on, the commission issued our our kind of statement and uh, priorities during this emergency and you no know, focus was on one, the core essentials of utility regulation, safe, reliable, affordable service, uh, continue to meet our, our work towards our clean energy goals and promote recovery. And so that was just a way for us to you know, articulate our priorities. And we also, in the course of that, tried to solicit people's ideas and proposals uh, to meet those and just, again, articulate what our priorities were. And so I think that was a helpful exercise internally. And for the commissioners, we definitely we did receive other ideas that came in through that, but it's helped, again, it's also helped us prioritize where we put our time and effort. And so if we look at where that is, we've had a lot of emergency requests, um, either do it in the beginning where Utility operate, utilities modify their operations to lower the risk to their customers uh, and to their operations. So we had a lot of really short turnaround requests for that that we need to uh, jump onto. We've had, uh, we tried to, as best as we can, maintain the momentum and the priority for our high profile, high impact dockets. So the performance-based regulation, a lot of the different Procurement activities, another major decision that we issued that aligns with all of these was to uh, open up and expand the phase two of the community renewable program. Um, we've had requests from, as Marco's aware, the distributed energy resource parties to uh, simplify and uh, speed up the interconnection process was their main ask uh, to help with the recovery. So those are, that's a, a snapshot. Um, so we, we've tried to maintain the, the momentum as best as we can with the high priority items that we already had, but also 
be very attentive to the, the quick emerging needs that come up and be aware that you know that that's going to be unfortunately that's kind of going to be the environment that we're in that utilities both operationally and increasingly now uh, financially you know are finding themselves in trouble and we need to be able to act and figure out a, a path forward yeah so this isn't really business as usual uh we're in a we're in a time of uh may i say crisis and so that's that'd be the top priority have you have you um uh, issued any particular rulings decisions of note in this period Do you, anything you want to mention in that connection uh yeah i mean i think the big the one i mean a few of them are not final yet a few are i think the community of renewable ones was major we're trying to um kick the market in that program the mm -hmm. first phase has been it's not the response that we've wanted uh so i know that was a priority is coming into this we're continuing to monitor and you don't see it as much publicly but we engage uh, independent observers to help mon uh, uh, monitor and and provide a level playing field for the bidding processes uh, so that's a huge time and resource effort from our commission and so that continues but i think probably i mean the big ones that you know the stuff that makes the front page of the news has been young brothers um we've we've i've personally spent a lot of time working with other agencies on the path forward on that uh, we don't have a final solution but as we're sitting here um working with the other agencies on proposed legislative changes that are up for hearing this afternoon so we're we're yet to issue a final decision on that but we've had to adapt going along as they've found themselves in a worse financial uh situation than they started the year and we un fully understand how important that service is particularly to the neighbor to the state and to the neighbor islands and so that's it's been a big time uh time time commitment for us to figure out a solution there mm -hmm. you said the hearing is the hearing on uh, on remote or is the hearing in person uh that is a, a hearing in the finance committee this afternoon at two o'clock uh they're hearing a bill part uh first sections would uh potentially offer means for financial assistance mm -hmm. and then we're looking at how we potentially transfer oversight uh for that company to department of transportation and the best means to do that so i've been working closely with other state agencies and the legislative leadership on what the path forward is there well that's pretty important marco you must have some questions about some of the uh, issues that are pending uh, some of the dockets yes please thank you jay so i mean uh, emergency requests urgency i mean that seems to be what's what's screaming out these days that everybody wants expedited treatment and like you said jay i mean the news is covering stuff like young brothers young brothers if i'm not mistaken is asking for essentially 25 million dollars from in, in public assistance right call it what it is and the, the commission is obviously an integral part of that discussion let's look at hawaiian electric as another example of a company that's a vital infrastructure in the state it covers five islands their sales are down somewhere in the double digits range similar to kiuc because of the loss of tourism and uh, hotel rooms that are empty and so forth and they're not going as far as i know they're not coming to the commission they're not coming to the state for for money but they're hurting they're hurting in terms of lost sales they're hurting in terms of substantially less revenue what means do they have as as the means have already been constituted to seek some type of relief from their financial pain of of this not only current loss but the loss of the last month and the prospective losses of month after month after month as tourist numbers are are, are going to be considerably down for an unknown period of time what kind of relief do they have open to them given the options available right now and and what kind of timeline are we talking about or, or can you can you give us an idea of uh, when the, conceivably they could get some relief uh no so marco the the, the i think the one aspect of this is the question of lost sales and impact you know, is cutting across all the companies that we deal with um but young brothers is one example but electric utilities gas utilities 
um, the water, I mean, everyone that has seen a drop, certainly, and, and if your customer base uh, was a higher proportion, commercial, industrial, particularly hotel districts, you know, you've seen a really big hit. Uh, so our electric utilities, fortunately, knock on wood, um, have have maintained a, a solid financial position. Uh, what we've seen throughout the industry is people going out and basically taking on additional lines of credit to shore up their liquidity, their cash position, because uh, they expect they're going to get less payments in the near term. So they still need to cover their costs. Um, so you've seen that reaction. We have existing we have existing regulatory mechanisms, and then people are asking. Uh, for some additional tools to help ride out the crisis. And so what I mean by that is, as I think I know Marco is aware, the utility, our uh, Hawaiian Electric companies have a decoupling mechanism uh, that that de literally decouples their annual revenues from their level of sales. And so as they they file with us every year what their, what's called target revenues um, and expected level of sales. And if they deviate, we true that up in a, subsequent time period. And so in this event, that helps insulate the utility from a, in this case, decline in sales. Um, but I think as you're aware that at some point, um, you need to make up for the lost revenues in that time period. And so there'll be, uh, the expectation is they will have to, they will look to collect that in the future. And the idea is that this is to help support or help to collect enough money to cover their roughly their fixed costs. Um, and so that's one mechanism, a second, which a lot of these utilities most have asked for is some, what you call regulatory accounting for costs of thing that they incur, uh, clearly attributed to this crisis. So they have to go out and buy out, buy new protective equipment. Um, they've had to modify their operations and their shifts of people. Uh, so they've set up accounts to track those costs asked to uh, take those off their books and held in a separate regulatory account. And then at a later time, we review those and adjudicate how much of those costs are prudent. Um, it's a, every state is doing some form of this. And the idea is that, you know, these, and again, how do you, what is every company is going through this? They've seen loss in sales, loss in revenues, and they have to figure out a way to ride this out. Um, I think the argument for public utilities is they're being asked to provide an essential public service. Um, they don't have a choice to close the doors if they find they, you know, needed to. And so they ask for some support through these kinds of tools by the government to help ride out their current costs so they can sustain their service. And Jay, when you say true up after the end of a certain period of time, uh, then there's an amount of money determined, right? And that amount of money, uh, I would think, I mean, it comes, it, it would come from the ratepayers, right? I mean, how, you can't just print money to make make up for that true, but it comes from ratepayers. And the squeeze being, correct me if I'm wrong, please, the squeeze being, you've got a ratepayer base that's already been squeezed, so to speak, by economic misfortune, right? And lost jobs and so forth, and people having a difficult time paying their utility bills. So here you've got our vital infrastructure that is in need of some relief between what was expected and what they actually received in a given period of time. And it's supposed to come from somewhere, and it's gonna come from the somewhere being the ratepayer base that has also been struggling as well. Am I, am I characterizing that correctly? Well, what the first is yes, I can't print money. So that part's correct. Well, and, and the legislature uh, is, is having is, you know a 2.3 budget shortfall this year so far. Um, and so it's it's hard to say the legislature can it can support the the shortfall in um, you know no and they're I mean that's not where they're asking I mean so the the your point's correct that it's the that shortfall would be made up by customers uh, in subsequent time periods and so this I mean a few points are important this is why cost management at all times is key that you you know you, your our job is to try and make sure that you know, this level of fixed costs are prudent and are there to try and sustain service through all cases. Um, the other part, and it's not a, a entirely offsetting, but the, we've seen the decline in oil prices, which is the other significant part of the bill, uh, uh, drop, you know, a, a lot, I mean, to record 
low levels to the point of having uh, negative spot market prices in certain uh, oil markets for a little while in the beginning. So there's been relief on that side that oil prices are down. So the fuel cost part of the bill is down, um, but making up the expected revenues with declining sales, you know, the money does come from us at one point or another. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I was, I was uh, really curious, Jay, about your view of this at the 50,000 foot level to see energy in the state. And so we've been talking about and uh, trying trying so hard over the past, what, 10 or 15 years to move to renewables, to make these renewable projects, uh, to move ahead. There's a, there's a dynamic, there's a target out there. And uh, it takes a lot of effort. There's some footfalls, of course. Uh, there are all kinds of things that have to happen for a given project to go ahead. And some of those things are you know, a challenge in the time of COVID. And my guess would be, uh, but I don't know, my guess would be a lot of these things have to be slower in the time of COVID. And that projects that we might have moved ahead on, you know, in ordinary times are, um, they're under duress. Uh, but tell us, how, how is the, the movement, the dynamic in energy doing these days? How is the, the effort to get to 100% renewable, for example, how is it doing? How has COVID affected that? Um, so I think we talked about this a little bit before we came on. I have a few few areas, few topics of response. So the first, uh, you know, if we look at the big picture with energy, particularly for the electricity utilities, and I give them credit, you know, the knock on wood, the lights have stayed on. And you know, at a time where we're working from home and our family security depends on you know, having reliable service, that's a, a credit to the work that they do. Um, and so that's positive. And that, it, you know, it, especially in the beginning for all utilities, all critical infrastructure operators are watching closely how potential infections would affect crews of their workers and concern that that would threaten their operational uh, capabilities. And we saw some of that with the utility in New York and you know, fingers crossed, you know, with to, as we've seen infections spread in other parts of the country, they're not going to see similar things. So, you know, they've managed through that challenge. It wasn't perfect. Um, but I think everyone tried to take extra precautions to make sure that we wouldn't see um, kind of devastating impacts on, on the on operate on the utility employees. Um, what we've seen since then are some of the other operational changes, the financial impacts that we talked about, and that's gonna take longer to sort out. Um, one thing we haven't talked about yet, but you know, is a pressing matter before us is our refinery has taken the, a financial hit and they're looking to raise their costs that they charge to sell, uh, for selling oil to one electric. Uh, so we have an emergency request to address that. Um, and so, you know, there's, you know, when you follow the complicated you, you know, kind of interrelations here, one, you know, basically the big drop in demand across the board has all these follow on effects that we're dealing with in a variety of different ways. So that's a constant juggling act. And we've got to keep focused on, again, what I, we talked about as one of our first priorities is safe, reliable and affordable basic services. So we go back to that and help us prioritize. Um, as far as clean energy initiative, I think it has helped in some respects kind of redouble people's focus on, you know, this is one of the bright spots of today in the future. Um, we're closely monitoring the progress of the projects we have in the pipeline and continue to ask questions, you know, where do things stand, how the events affected their uh, ability to meet existing timelines and I think the general answer is certainly it's going to have an effect but we're continuing to see progress um, and I would also like to say we've been working close or trying to coordinate closely with our state energy office where you know, recovery you know, using renewable energy clean energy industry as a strategy for recovery is one of the tasks that they're taking on and so it's kept our focus on uh, that industry and 
definitely the projects that we have in the pipeline. Thank you, Jay. Well, Marco, we're, we're pretty much out of time, and I wonder if you could take a minute and uh, summarize and um, sort of put this, put this in a, a summary going forward, because we do want to have Jay come back, right, Jay? You're going to come back, right, Jay? And, uh, and we're going to you know, track on it going forward. But what, what would your summary of this discussion be? Oh, my, my mind bursts with summary, Jay. I mean, that's kind of where, where do I, where do I take, uh, where do I go with this? Uh, we barely scratched the surface and there's so much more to cover, but uh, I mean, uh, there, there's such a sense of, uh, of urgency with so many of these matters, whether it's Young Brothers, whether it's Par Petroleum, whether it's Hawaiian Electric, whether it's fill in the blank, fill in the blank, fill in the blank. And um, I don't know what I would do if I was sitting in Jay's chair, I would probably be cowering in the corner far too much of the time, but uh, I'm, I'm so glad that you've got, so we've got Jay and Jenny Potter and Leo Asensio and the fantastic staff there to, to tackle this because, uh, I mean, it's gotta be done. You know, we've we gotta, gotta keep the lights on, we gotta keep the barges going in our island and hopefully not too many containers tumbling off into the ocean like happened last week. Uh, it's kind of mind blowing. So I just have a, you know, a deep grit of uh, deep, feeling of gratitude towards you, Jay, and the whole staff there for uh, for persevering, us using the P word, persevering, you know, through thick and thin over and over and over again. And I wanted to ask Jay, maybe we'll, I'll, I'll seed it for, for next time, you know. As far as I know, Jay, I recall you've got two years and one day left in your current term, right? But who's counting? Uh, <laughs> I, I wasn't thinking about that, but that is an accurate count. <laughs> well, maybe well, no, no, before we get on that, I, you asked what you would do in my shoes. Uh, you get the best team you have around you and fortunate. I mean, you named it, but that's what keeps us going. And I try to thank them as, as best as I can every day. And that has been, that is what keeps us going. One person can only do one thing, but we have an effective team. You know, you, it's rewarding to see what you can do. Well, I, I'll, I'll make my summary too, uh, largely, uh, you know, the same as uh, Marco, but I, I want to say that I really appreciate the effort you guys have been putting in, because it's more than normal. This is abnormal. These are abnormal times, and you're, you're, you're meeting those times by working harder and looking over the energy field. Um, and, I, and I feel that the fact that the lights are on, um, of course, I think of the utilities, but I also think of you, Jay. Uh, thank you very much for being conscious, you know, conscientious about that and making that happen and looking over it for us. Uh, thank you, Jay Griffin, uh, Chair of the PUC, Marco Mangelsdorf of ProVision Solar and Hilo. Thank you so much both. I hope we can do this again soon. Aloha. Here. Aloha. Good to see you both and look forward to the next time.